578. magnificent, inexhaustible topic, how I wish we could spend more time on it than we will. I've planned 15 messages on it, and even that is not sufficient. It's amazing how, as we consider the character, the person, the nature, the works of God, all expressed in his names, it encompasses for us basically all of Scripture. All of his revelation, because the scripture reveals who he is and what he has done, is doing, and will do in the future. We find it as we look at the names of God. Today it's part 12. We 
have seen that great passage a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, where he gives us some of his central names, where he gives to us extensions from those central names, where he expresses relationships in those central names to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where he tells us his names are for a memorial. It is that by which we remember him, who he is, and what he has done. Last week as we began our study, we noted a new name that I had just discovered that week in Jeremiah 51, 19, that name, the portion of Jacob. The one who is the portion of Jacob is the former of all things, that is, he is the creator, and he is the Lord of hosts, that is his name, Yahweh Sabaoth. That is the God whom we have studied, and he is the one who is considered the portion of Jacob. Have you ever had a portion of something, a portion of real estate, or perhaps not quite so grand, just a portion of food, but it belonged to you? And God says, I am the one who belongs to Jacob, special privileges to Israel. We looked at some of the names that show the intensity of the character of God last week, especially we looked at the name El Shaddai, which is the name Elohim combined with Shaddai. That is the almighty God, the nurturing God, the first place it occurs in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, where God is speaking to Abraham, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, none of us here have quite reached that yet, though some are moving close to that direction. When Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. <laughs> what a command. Walk before me. Be perfect. El Shaddai is the one who has commanded that. We noted five things out of that chapter, Genesis chapter 17, which is a restatement of the Abrahamic covenant, first given in Genesis 12, restated in chapter 15, restated in 17, restated in chapter 22. God speaking to Abraham, we noted five things that are very important in this passage. This is the first occurrence of the name El Shaddai, the Almighty God. First place in the Bible. And whenever you have a first occurrence in Scripture with other occurrences that follow, the first occurrence sets the stage for all that will come. Number two, this is the place where God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Before this, he was only Abram. In chapter 12, he was only Abram. In chapter 15, he was only Abram. Well, there was that cutting of that covenant. In chapter 17, God says, now I'm giving you a new name. You know, we sing a song, there's a new name written up in glory, and it's mine. The book of Revelation talks about how we receive a new name. Perhaps you didn't like your earthly name. Perhaps the name that God will give us will be a name that expresses our character. Perhaps it will be related to our accomplishments for Christ. We don't know, but names in Scripture have meaning. And God will give us, regardless of what our parents gave us, God will give us a perfect name. It will be for his glory. Here God changes Abram's name to Abraham. Number three, this is the place where God made the Abrahamic covenant an everlasting covenant. When we see it in chapter 12, it is not stated as an everlasting covenant, but here it is spoken of as an everlasting covenant. Number four, this is the place where God expanded the Abrahamic covenant given in Genesis 12 to include specific real estate, the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. An everlasting covenant is specifically stated in the text. An everlasting possession is specifically stated in that text. Circumcision, as we saw, number five, is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant and for national Israel, for whom God still has future blessings, and it's a sign that has never changed. The second place where El Shaddai is translated Almighty God, we saw, was in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 5. That was the vision of God sitting upon his throne and the angelic beings surrounding the throne, much like we see in Isaiah chapter 6 which we've studied in some detail. 
Here the cherubim's wings were heard in the outer court as the voice of Almighty God when he speaketh. Usually El Shaddai we saw was translated as God Almighty, twice used of fruitfulness in a reflection of the Edenic covenant and the Noahic covenant to be fruitful and multiply. You remember back in Genesis, God told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. He restated that again to Noah after the flood, be fruitful and multiply. We see that Isaac commanded Jacob in the context of the Abrahamic covenant to be fruitful and multiply, and he used the name God Almighty. God Almighty, bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. We saw God commanding Jacob at Bethel to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant by being fruitful and multiplying. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, that is El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Dear people, we find this is God's plan for God's people. It's not to have as few children as you possibly can so that you can live a pleasant life with no distress and no pain and no worry. God views children as an incredible blessing. Be fruitful and multiply. Stated over and over in scripture. Once it's used by Jacob, this almighty God, El Shaddai, as he sends his sons back to Egypt with Benjamin. And El Shaddai give you mercy before the man that he may send you away with your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. He petitions El Shaddai, the one who has given the Abrahamic covenants, the Abrahamic promises, who has nurtured as a father, this little group, this little band of people who is someday to grow into a mighty nation. Once it's used by Jacob as he reminds Joseph of the Abrahamic covenant. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty, El Shaddai appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. In other words, the name El Shaddai is very clearly and very powerfully, very powerfully attached to the Abrahamic covenant. And then suddenly, as we noted last week, there comes a change of name by which God chooses to be known by his people. In Exodus 6.3, God is speaking. And he's speaking to Moses and he says, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of El Shaddai, God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known. Unto them, And we noted last week that the name Jehovah had been revealed before this. But the people didn't really know him in that close and intimate sense of Yahweh. Jehovah. This would be the key name that goes with his people from this point forward. God chose to use the name El Shaddai when Israel was in its infancy. At the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant... But now as God forms Israel into a mighty nation and delivers them with a strong arm out of Egypt, he causes them to know him by his name, Yahweh. And then he establishes the Mosaic Covenant. And be careful, the Mosaic Covenant is not the same thing as the Abrahamic Covenant. They are clearly and distinct. Never confuse those two covenants. Much more on that later as we get further into the book of Exodus. Sometimes El Shaddai is translated as the Almighty. And it's interesting, that was the principal name of God that Job knew. Job dates back to the time of Abraham. Job dates back long before the development of the nation of Israel. The book of Job is perhaps the oldest book of the Old Testament in terms of not merely what it records, but in terms of the one who wrote it. Yes, Job. Two-thirds of the time that he refers to God, two-thirds of all of the occurrences of El Shaddai in the Old Testament occur in the book of Job. That was an ancient name for God. We find that it is used in the prophetic patriarchal blessings by Jacob and only occurs in the blessing to Joseph. We found that Balaam used that name for 
Almighty God. We find that Ruth, the book of Ruth, Naomi speaks of God disciplining her as a child. Twice she speaks of that name, the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me, where she says, change my name from pleasant to bitter. Naomi meaning pleasant, and Mara meaning bitter. We saw that's an important thing to remember when we go through difficult times and there seems to be no apparent reason for our suffering. And we looked at Romans chapter 8. What a magnificent passage. And Paul concludes, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And then he tells us, just ten verses later, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That's God when he is known by his name El Shaddai, the nurturing, disciplinary Father God, working in the lives of his children through suffering to bring them to maturity and heavenly rewards in glory when they win their race of life. Today, we move to the next name, El Elyon, Most High God. We find the first occurrence in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. In fact, there are only 11 occurrences of this name in the Bible, and four of them are in this passage here in Genesis chapter 14. Four out of the 11 times the name is found. In other words, more than 36% of the occurrences are found in one very important key passage of Scripture. Let me read it to you. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is when Lot is captured, you remember. And all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew. Now his name hasn't been changed yet to Abraham. That doesn't occur until chapter 17. This is back in chapter 14. He's called Abram, but he's also called the Hebrew. That's the first place in the Bible where Hebrew, the designation Hebrew, is found. Abram the Hebrew. The only other person, by the way, to be called a Hebrew in the book of Genesis is Joseph. Two times we find he is called a Hebrew in the singular. We find two other occurrences where it's in the plural, speaking of the Hebrews when uh, Pharaoh and his court are referring to them. Then that term is used many, many times for the Israelites when they're in bondage in the book of Exodus. We find it in the singular 26 times in the Bible, 22 times more in the plural. Uh, and it is used also in the New Testament, a very biblical term to use. So this is when Abram the Hebrew dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol, the brother of Anir, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. A whole group of kings has come down, and Abram is willing to go with only 318 soldiers. This is a commando strike force that is going out after these kings that have captured two entire cities. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night. We have some good tactics going on here. And smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Now those of you who have been with me in the evening services know how far away Damascus is. From Jerusalem all the way up to Damascus is about 160 miles by the roads in Paul's day. Now, we're talking about going all the way from Sodom and Gomorrah down on the Dead Sea, all the way up to Hobah, which is near Damascus. That was a pretty long flight, and they didn't have trucks and tanks. They didn't have armored vehicles. They didn't have airplanes. But he chases them all the way up there. And he brought back all the goods, and he brought again his brother Lot and his goods, and the women also. Very important note in the text in Genesis 14. Because in Genesis chapter 19, God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their sodomy. 
It wasn't because all the women had been taken and they had nothing else. The text makes it clear. And the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Heraleomer, and the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. Now here's our key verses. Here's where we begin. To hear about El Elyon, the Most High God. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest. That's the first descriptor of this one who is El Elyon. He is the descriptor of this Melchizedek. He is the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, second occurrence, possessor of heaven and earth. That's our second descriptor. And blessed be the Most High God, third use of the name which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. There's your third description of what this God does. And he gave him, that is Abraham, gave to Melchizedek tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. In other words, all I want back is the people. That's what I want. That's always what Satan wants. He doesn't care about stuff. He cares about the souls of men and women and boys and girls. Give me the people. You can keep all the stuff, but give me the people. Dear friend, Satan is the enemy of your soul. Satan will do everything he can to ensnare you, to trap you, to get you to walk disobediently to God, to the Most High God. He doesn't care about stuff. He cares about getting you. And how he uses stuff to entrap us. But Abraham didn't fall for that trap. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up my hand unto the Lord El Elyon, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. That repeats the second descriptor that was given. That El Elyon is the possessor, the one who owns heaven and earth. I have made a vow to him because he owns everything. Why should I be interested in your little trinkets? Interesting, because as we look at the New Testament where this is quoted, we discover some things that reveal to us who Melchizedek is and who El Elyon is. Hebrews 7.1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. I wish we had time to discuss Hebrews chapter 7 and all that's in it. But friends, what we have here in Hebrews chapter 7 and the author of Hebrews, whom I believe to be Paul, makes clear to us is that Melchizedek is a theophany, or more technically, a Christophany. An appearance of the second person of the Godhead in the Old Testament prior to the Incarnation. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And how did Jesus reply? Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, Ego emi, I am. And they took up stones to stone him. He tied two passages of scripture together. He tied this passage in Genesis chapter 14 together with Exodus chapter 3 where Moses is at the burning bush. And he's telling them that the one who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush and called him to lead the children of Israel out and form them into a nation, that one who spoke to Moses at the burning bush was the one who spoke to Abraham at the slaughter of the kings. That's powerful, folks. Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And he goes on to say, obviously, the one who is less is blessed by the one who is better. And it was Melchizedek who blessed Abraham, the man who had all the promises. Oh, there's so much in that text. 
El Elyon, the Most High God. The name Most High God, El Elyon, is the name by which God is known to the heathen round about God's people, proving that God is greater than their gods. Let me give you some illustrations of that. Daniel chapter 3, verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of El Elyon, ye servants of the Most High God. Nebuchadnezzar at this point is a pagan. Nebuchadnezzar has not yet learned his lesson. Nebuchadnezzar has not yet crawled around on the ground like an animal eating gra grass like an ox. But he knows who the God is of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they've changed the word of the king. They're not consumed in the fire. They're walking around and Nebuchadnezzar said, I see, how many did we throw in? They said three. He said, I see four walking around in there and one is like unto the Son of God. Who do you think was walking with them? in the midst of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar recognized it. It was a God greater than any God he had ever imagined. Ye servants of El Elyon, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth, come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. What fire do you know of that burns and does not consume? Was there a fire at the burning bush that Moses turned aside to see? A fire that burned on the bush but did not consume the bush. We've studied it, haven't we? It's the Shekinah, glory of God. It burns but it does not consume God's people. It is designed for his glory. It is designed to judge his enemies and those who rebel against him. For example, Korah and Nadab and Abihu. We don't have time to go there today, but you know how the fire came out and devoured the 250 from the tabernacle that were going to offer false incense, false fire on the altar of God. Hmm, people. The incredible God who is the most high God. All the gods of the nations are nothing compared to him. We find this is the name that we see Daniel using to Belshazzar the night of the drunken orgy banquet where the hand appears on the wall. Daniel 5, 18, And thou, king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Who gave it to Nebuchadnezzar? The most high God. El Elyon. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that El Elyon, the Most High God, ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. That's powerful, folks. We're talking about one of the greatest empires that ever was. And Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that lesson that the Most High God, El Elyon, appoints over every nation, over every great kingdom that has ever ruled earth. He appoints over it whom he wills. Why does he appoint some of those whom we look at as we prayed a few moments ago? Why does he appoint some of those whom we look at with wonder and amazement how such evil men throughout history could have risen to power? Habakkuk asks that question. He says, God, how can you send these Chaldeans to judge us? They're worse than we are. God can use even a pagan nation that is worse than you are to judge you. But God says, their time is coming too. I pray for our country. I pray for our country. But I pray especially for the Christians who have lost their salt and are no longer the savor that they are supposed to be. 
And when the salt hath lost its savor, it is good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Makes a great thing to throw down on the road where it'll kill weeds and people can walk on it. I hope that hasn't happened yet in the United States. Looks like we're on the brink at the very least. Are we being cast out so that we will be trodden under foot of men? Have we lost our savor? He was driven from the sons of men so that he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men. I was planning to read you the entire context. I had a number of comments. I think I'll just make a few of those comments here. You know, the handwriting has appeared on the wall. The king is deeply troubled. The queen mother says, there's a man in your kingdom who can read this. He calls for Daniel. Daniel's brought into the king. They ask him a couple of questions. The king tells him, the wise men, the astrologers have been brought in before me to read this writing, to make known unto me the interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. What we learn from that, and particularly in the context of our own country, is human and demonic knowledge is pathetically trivial and incomplete. Even the wisest men can't solve the problems. Those who were astrologers were, of course, demonically controlled. We find in the next verse, it says, I've heard thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet. Ooh, nice clothes. And have a chain of gold about thy neck. Hmm, nice, pretty, pretty. And thou shalt be third ruler in the kingdom. You'll have some power. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. All of it is offered to Daniel. You know, it's rather... Ironic, because in the context, human honor and riches are, again, pathetically worthless in the flight or in the face of impending death. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel could have said, hey, look, you're in trouble, but I'm out of here. <laughs> he didn't. God's servants serve him without fear. It was a bad message. They serve him without heed to human honor and human riches. Even when they're carrying a bad message. O oh, thou king. Now here's our verse. El Eleon, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. God chooses whom he will to rule, including here in the United States. And he goes on and describes his majesty, and then in verse 20 he says, But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. That's good truth for all of us, not merely for kings. Pride goeth before destruction, and haughty spirit before a fall. There will be a payday someday. There will be a day of reckoning for all, not merely for those who are, quote, great people. And he was driven out until he knew that the Most High God ruled in the sons of men. There's another name for God that appears in this text. We won't have time to look at it. But down in verse 23 it says, But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. The Lord of heaven. That's another of the names of God. We won't have time to look at it. There are so many names we won't get a chance to look at. And you've brought the vessels of his house before you, you and your lords and your wives and concubines. You've drunk wine in them. They took the sacred vessels from the temple. Those had all been captured in the Babylonian captivity. 586 B.C. They'd all been taken away. And now, in a drunken orgy, Belshazzar is using them to drink his pagan wine out of. Do you think God was pleased with that? I don't think so. And you know the interpretation of it. But it ends that chapter, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. God didn't wait around for this judgment. 
In that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. When God sends his judgments, he doesn't tarry. What about the United States? Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. He was 62 years old when he conquered Babylon. You know, not only is El Elyon the name by which the pagans know who God is, he's greater than their gods. El Elyon, the Most High God, is the name by which God is known to the demons. Mark chapter 5, verse 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? They know who Jesus is. He's the Son of El Elyon. He's the Son of the Most High God, I adjure thee by God, thou torment me not. We find another illustration of that in the book of Acts. We find the, the woman who is possessed with the spirit of Python. That's translated the spirit of divination, but in Greek it's the spirit of Python. Python, the, the great massive serpent that crushes its prey and then swallows it whole. This is this demon-possessed girl in Acts chapter 16. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of... The Most High God, El Elyon. The demons know God by that name. The Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. The name of the Most High God is the name of God that is blasphemed when God's people do three different things. Number one, when they disobey him. Number two, when they focus on money and material things. And number three, when they commit immorality. The most high God, who is greater than the pagan gods, is blasphemed by the pagans. He's ridiculed by the pagans. He's brought to their scorn when God's people do those three things. I'm, there's so many verses on this, i just give you a few of them. Psalm 76, uh, 78, 56. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not his testimonies. The context of Psalm 78, would you know what it is? It's Exodus and the carnal wilderness wanderings. And the pagans round about blasphemed the name of the Most High God as they saw the children of Israel wandering through the wilderness and doing all the wicked things that they did. And God held them back for 40 years and let them die in the wilderness because they rebelled against him ten times. The name of God is blasphemed among the pagans because of you. Look at this. Here's another one. Here's an illustration of how God's name is blasphemed when people commit immorality. This is Nathan the prophet speaking. He's speaking to David. Howbeit, because by this deed, that is his adultery, Thou, that's David, has given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Psalm 74.10 O God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? James 2.7 It comes to us, folks. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? He's speaking of the rich who have focused on money and oppressed the poor. They blaspheme the name by which we are called. That's the name of Christ. Takes you back to Genesis 14. The one who is the priest of El Elyon. Dear people, if we understood who God is, if we understood our relationship to him, if we understood how his names reveal who he is, not merely to us, but by which he is known among the pagans, known to the demons, known to the enemies, enemies who blaspheme his name. Oh, would it change our lives if we really believed that? El Leon. We have five minutes. Maybe I can hit one more. The next name that we look at is El Olam, Everlasting God. This occurs first for us in Genesis 21, 33. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, 
and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. The everlasting God. What a beautiful name that is. We find it in many verses that we all know. Isaiah 40, 28, hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. Or Romans 16, 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. He's speaking of the gospel there. It's the one that has been provided for us by the everlasting God. El Olam, the everlasting God, describes the nature and eternality of the Messiah. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, you know this verse. You've heard it sung many times at Christmas. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Now listen to the last phrase. Listen to the last phrase. Whose goings forth, he's been proceeding, he's been doing, he's been active, whose goings forth have been from of old, that's the word kedem, from everlasting, that's olam, you know that's a messianic verse. That's the Old Testament prophecy about where Jesus would be born. Notice what the scribes and priests left out when they quoted that passage, Matthew 2. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ, Christos, same as Mashiach, Messiah, the anointed one, where is going to be the Messiah born? And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet. And here they quote Micah 5 2. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Period. They entirely left out the last statement about the Messiah whose goings forth have been of old, even from everlasting. Adolam. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is from everlasting. We find that same word used in Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6, you know well from Messiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. We've talked about that, El Gibor. The Everlasting Father. Olam again. The Prince of Peace. What we have as we look at this name of God is the eternal existence from God, of God from eternity past to eternity future. It's essential to his nature, and by the way, it is an irrefutable answer to atheistic evolution and to the eternality of matter. You can have only eternal something, one or the other. Either God is eternal or matter is eternal. If there is no God, matter has got to be eternal, and we can prove that it is not. Everything is winding down. First and second laws of thermodynamics. There had to come a point at which all matter was created, and it was wound up, and then it is running down, and it will run out. And then there will be equilibrium throughout all the universe, second law of thermodynamics. This speaks of God. The Bible says that God is eternal. What magnificent passages of scripture we find, and pointing to Christ. Proverbs 8, verse 22 and 23, the Lord possessed me. Here is the wisdom, by the way. I, uh, Proverbs chapter 8 is dealing with wisdom. And it is a personified wisdom which reflects Christ because Christ is made unto us the wisdom of God. All these things in Proverbs 8 speak of Christ. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from Olam, from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was, even before creation took place. 
Psalm 41, 13, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth of the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Preexistent before creation. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen, praise ye the Lord. Amen, praise ye the Lord. Jeremiah 10.10 But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And an everlasting Olam King. At his wrath the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. That's Revelation 19. Jesus Christ, the everlasting King who comes to judge the earth. We have a magnificent God, people. We have a magnificent God. The title is also related to his name, Eternal God. We don't have time to look at all those occurrences. I'll read you just one verse. Deuteronomy 33, 27, a great verse. I love this verse. Memorized it as a child many, many years ago. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. The eternal God is your refuge. He's the one who existed in eternity past before any of creation was made. He's the one who will exist all the way into eternity future. And he's the one who has picked us up along the way to go with him. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. He is the one who is the judge. Dear people, this is our God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the way in which you have revealed yourself through your names. We're overwhelmed. We're awestruck. The way that you are known, not merely to those who are your children, but the way that you are known, not merely intellectually, but by experience, to those who are your enemies, to those who are the pagans who realize you are greater than their gods, a name by which you are known even to the demons who fear and tremble. And you are our God, by the grace of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, how we thank you. And how we bow and fall in humble adoration before your feet. How we thank you that you chose us. That you have placed your love upon us. That you have redeemed us. That you have given us life in Christ. That you have given us your indwelling Holy Spirit and your word. Whereby we might know how to please you. Oh Father, that we might indeed please you through obedience. Father, take your word as it has been expounded today and use it in our hearts to transform us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, and to give him the glory. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.